Welcome to Milkshake Monday, episode 253, A Giant Fight. I am Anita Helm, and this is being brought to you by Fordos Productions. I want to let you know that as of 7 August 2023, we will be live streaming exclusively from our Fordos Productions, at Fordos Productions YouTube channel. So please take note of that at 9 o'clock p.m. Eastern Standard Time, starting 7 August, we will be live streaming only from at Fordos Productions on YouTube. So that's going to be an exciting time for us. And we're getting new equipment and everything regarding that. Also, don't forget about Let's Get Connected, our homeless uh, event that's going to be in memory of William Dallas Helm, who started that many years ago. We are excited for the opportunity to share and to give to those in need. Someone said to us a few years back when they came to donate and support, they said, oh, these people don't look homeless. What does homeless look like? When people are struggling, living in somebody else's house, in their basement, in their car, you don't know what they look like. But if people are coming to receive help, we are there to provide that help. And thank you for those who are donating and calling me to ask how they can help. Feel free to reach out to the Resurrection Baptist Church whether you're calling on the phone to talk to Winnie K. Burns or send me a comment, however you can find the information to get to us, whatever help, we will appreciate it. Now, I got to give you something free before I start this teaching. When things come and I see things come in my, in my sight and I ask God if something kind of bothers me in my spirit, I, I write it down because I say, okay, God, I'm going to address this. I happen to see this young child and the young child not only was talking back to the adult, but slapped the adult. And the adult kind of pacified and went on about their business, letting the child just slap. And I said, oh, this is not right. And I said, you know, we got to a point, but I'm going to address this really quickly. I want us to remember the scripture out of Proverbs 22, 6, which says, train up a child in the way that they should go. And when they're old, they will not depart. But what you see from the child's perspective, there's a lack of training, but let me give you perspective of what they're lacking in the training of. The child is lacking an understanding of who God is, who the parent or adult in their life is, who and what love means in that relationship and discipline. That's what the child is lacking understanding of. The child is also lacking boundaries. They think that it's okay to do and talk and to touch in any kind of way because the adult in their life or the adults in their life have not established a structure of understanding about boundaries and they've also not found themselves giving them a schedule. And you say, why do you talk about schedule? Because a child has a rhythm of life, just like we have rhythm in sleeping, we have rhythm in when a child grows to walk, a rhythm in when a child's schedule of development, all kinds of things. But people can't just let children do anything they want. And the last two things is that the child lacks an understanding and training in respect and compassion. Now, on the flip side, there's a lack of training and understanding of people who are actually rearing up children. They lack the same understanding when it comes to the things of the Lord, what the Lord requires of them just having children, whose children they are. They lack the full understanding of what an adult is supposed to do and be in a child's life. They lack the understanding of love and discipline. The Lord says that he disciplines the ones that he loves. The same is true of the children. I'm not talking about abuse. I'm not talking about doing anything torturous to a child, but there's a level of discipline that children need. And the same is true about boundaries of parenthood. The same is true about guardianship or grandparenting. All those things are important, especially during a child's development. If you do not teach the children about the boundaries or structures or schedules or them understanding the respect that you have for them, but they must have to you and the compassion and love that you have toward them that they need to have to you and others, you are going to see more of these children at young children's ages slapping and talking back. And then when they start to be adolescents in their 20s and 30s, you're wondering why these parents are being cussed out, punched out, and killed. The children from the folly of their childhood never had the training. So now that they're old, they're not departing from the folly of their youth. They're just getting worse because Satan wants them to continue to be worse. So that's just a free public service announcement about parenting one-on-one. 
read the word of God. Now, tonight, I am excited. I have been excited about this teaching since I wanted to teach it Saturday. That's how excited I was. Now, I said a giant fight. And when you think of a fight, I want you to imagine that at the beginning of this teaching, I'm going to give you six takeaways from the first round of the fight. And then at the end of the teaching, I'm going to give you six takeaways at the end, the final round of the fight, okay? So I'll try not to talk fast because when I get excited, I do talk fast. But I want you to appreciate that the fight that I said, a giant fight, a giant fight in the things that are going on in our lives, the problems, the challenges, whatever we have going on that we think is a fight or battle, trouble. The trouble and the fight and the challenge is giant in our mind. And God is puny, tiny, little, small. By the time we finish tonight's teaching, I want you to understand that there's no fight that is bigger than God. When you think of the almighty God, I want you to remember without any shadow of a doubt that there is no fight, battle, challenge, trouble that you come against in your life that God is not more powerful. Now, let me give you these six takeaways before we start the teaching on the actual scripture. Whenever we as Christian believers have a fight in our life, here's the six things that we start out in the fight thinking. And some of this is messed up thinking, but this is the reality of what a lot of people go through to include myself at times. So I'm taking away this teaching just like you. Number one takeaway, from the natural man's perspective, whatever we have as a fight looks like we have an unfair disadvantage. That whatever we're coming against look like it's totally going to overcome us. It's unfair, but it's against us. That's the first takeaway. Whenever you find that you're in a fight, a challenge, a battle, the world will look at that battle and they'll say, they will say, it's unfair and it's against us. The second takeaway is that with any fight that you or I are going through, there's always a choice of two Fs, fear or faith. There's two choices. With any fight or battle we go through in this life, it's a choice of two Fs, fear or faith. Now, the third takeaway the fights that we are going through, we believe that they're all solely in the natural realm of what we see, hear, and can touch. We do not have that understanding and are ignorant and distrust what's happening in the supernatural realm. So in the battles and the fights that we have, we see and believe and distrust because we see only what's happening in the natural realm. That's the third takeaway. The fourth takeaway is that we believe that for Christians, we cannot understand that whatever battle God has us in, there are going to be some unconventional decisions and understanding. Now, I wanted to give you the first scripture tonight, Proverbs chapter three, verses five through seven, but I only reference part of it. It says, Trust in the Lord with all of your heart and lean not to your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him and he will direct your path. However, in the beginning of our fights, the first round of our fights, we do not want to trust in the Lord because what he will ask us to do is unconventional to the natural logic of man. It will be something that will confound those of us looking at what is naturally before us, God saying to do X and we say, there's no way I can do X and succeed and, and, and win this fight. But that's what you're going to see tonight. Now, in takeaway number five, the fight is about God. Any fight that we're going into is about God. But when you see scriptures like Ephesians 6, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers, the fiery darts are hitting us. So we think because the fiery darts and all the things that are problems are hitting us in that fight, it's about us. It's about our lack of money or our lack of relationship, or our lack of understanding. 
anything. So I just want you to understand that the fight is about God. The darts are coming at you, but it's all because Satan wants you to walk away from God, distrust God, and then he wants you to think when the victory is won that it's about you winning the victory and not about God. Now, the last one of the six takeaways, God doesn't play with his enemies. We do. God, the almighty father, the almighty God, the prince of peace, the Lord of lords, the king of kings does not play with enemies. We do. God destroys enemies. He doesn't leave them standing around to play games with later. Now, knowing that, you know where I'm going tonight. Ooh, it's going to be good because God showed me some things I am excited to share with you. First Samuel chapter 17, we're going to start with verses 1 and go all the way through 11, and then we're going to jump down to verse 38 through 57. Now, before you got to chapter 17 of 1 Samuel, remind yourself that David has the anointing of God. The spirit of a God was upon David from that day forward in 1 Samuel 16, verse 13. So you have to remember that. This young man, David, I'm going to tell you some things about Goliath. I'm going to tell you some things about David. I'm trying to slow it down because I'm excited. Anyway, so I'm going to read the first 11 verses, but I'm going to let you see some things that I did not see until the Holy Spirit shared with me. So I am just excited and thankful. It says, now the Philistines gathered their forces for war and assembled at Sokoth and Judah. They pitched camp at Ephesus, Demon, between Sacho and Ezekah. Saul and the Israelites assembled and camped in the Valley of Elah and drew up their battle line to meet the Philistines. The Philistines occupied one hill and the Israelites another with the valley between them. Now, a champion named Goliath. We always hear about the champion Goliath. He was their hero. He was the biggest and baddest tough guy for the Philistines. If he could take out Israel's, whether it's their champion or it's their battle lines, they knew they were fine because he was big and bad, right? So a champion named Goliath, who was from Gath, came out of the Philistine camp. His height was six cubits and a span. He had a bronze helmet on his head and wore a coat of scale of armor, bronze weighing 5,000 shekels. Now, as I get ready to read verses six through seven, I want you to notice something that I didn't notice. When they outline everything that Goliath had, notice they don't mention his sword. They don't mention his sword, but they mention everything else to even to the point of the weight of different things. But look what it says in verse six. On his legs, he wore bronze greaves and a bronze javelin was slung on his back. So on his back, he has this javelin. His spear shaft was like a weaver's rod and its iron point weighed 600 shekels. His shield bearer went ahead of him. Now, from what we see, we have seen his armor. We've seen his helmet. We've seen the coat. We've also seen on his legs, he's got these bronze greaves. He's got this bronze javelin slung on his back, his spear shaft, and his weaver's rod, and his iron point weighing 600 shekels. And then his shield bearer went ahead of him, right? Verse 8, Goliath stood and shouted to the ranks of Israel, Why do you come out and line up to battle? Am I not a Philistine? And are you not the servants of Saul? Choose a man, have him come down to me. Now here's the caveat of the deal that Goliath is proposing. He's going to say, before I read the scripture, if your man can beat me, then we'll become subjects to you. But if I beat your man, you guys are not only going to become subjects to us, but you're going to serve us. He doesn't put that in the deal, but he says, he basically thinks, I'm going to beat y'all. It's not even a question in his mind. But he's telling you, this is the deal. If, verse 9, if he is able to fight and kill me, we will become your subjects. But if I overcome him and kill him, you will become our subjects and serve us. 
Then the Philistine said, now this is where you have to understand about those six takeaways, because as this whole teaching unfolds in 1 Samuel 17, this Goliath, a giant that does not have God Almighty as his Lord, he has other gods. He doesn't really even know the nation of Israel and their God. He said gods, whatever. But he's getting ready to talk some trash, disrespect, disregard to the armies of Israel. But he's basically disrespecting God and the God of Israel as he's saying this. So here you go. Then the Philistine said, this day, I defy the armies of Israel. I defy God. Give me a man and let us fight each other. On hearing the Philistines' words, who gets scared? Remember, fear and faith. You got two F's and a choice of a fight. Saul and all the Israelites were dismayed and terrified. At the beginning of this fight that hasn't even started, they already realized that they think they're unmatched. They think that this, this fight is not fair and everything against them with this giant against these people looks to be a mess. And then you have a situation of the two Fs. They got the fear. You just see it here. But then they also have the situation that they, because they only can understand in the natural realm, they already are, are thinking this is over. We're going to be killed and we're going to be serving these Philistines. But then... There's some unconventional decisions about to start happening in this story. And we're going to see that we are going to be doing something when it comes to God and his enemies and how God doesn't play. And we may have thought this soldier and these armies were going to play with these Philistines in a sense of just giving up. No, not God. So look at what David, David comes on the scene. His daddy, Jesse says, go check on your brother, see what's going on with the battle. He hears this uncircumcised Philistine talking trash. Brothers pissed at him for even asking and being there and seeing him afraid and the other brothers there. And so David hears that there's good stuff happening if somebody can beat this guy. David goes and he's taken to King Saul and he says, hey, he gives his resume. I've taught this before about that portion of it. And he says, I've killed a bear and I've killed a lion before. This Philistine's not going to be nothing against me. Saul goes with it. I don't think he really believes it, but he goes with it. So in jump to, so where are you going to see here? So say, David says to Saul, Saul said to David, go and the Lord be with you. Now, Saul doesn't realize that as of 1 Samuel 16, the Lord is with him. He's been anointed with the spirit of the Lord. Saul's spirit, the spirit of God has left Saul and he's got a distressing spirit. But David has the spirit of the Lord, the Holy Ghost. The Holy Spirit is about David. So David is speaking the words of what the spirit is giving him, the empowerment, the encouragement, the trust, and the understanding. You can't talk trash about God's people. So here he jumped to the verse 38. Then Saul dressed David in his own tunic. He put a coat of armor on him and bronze helmet on his head. David fastened on his sword over the tunic and tried walking around because he was not used to them. Y'all got to go and listen to if the armor don't fit. That's a good teaching. You go on back and look at it. But David recognized that what Saul was trying to give him was unproven, untested, unfamiliar. He knew that when he had defeated the bear and the lion, it wasn't him. It was him with the Lord that the Lord allowed him to grab the whiskers and take the sheep out and be able to live to tell that tale. But Saul was letting him put conventional wisdom to put on an armor and a helmet to go against another very giant champion. And it would only make sense to say, you need some kind of protection, boy. My, my servants here that are armed soldiers are afraid and shaking and terrified. And you're just a boy. That was coming to bring some, some cheese and crackers to the, to the front line. His wisdom said, give this boy some shield. You know, make it a little hard for this guy to get, you know, this little guy to get killed. But David said, I cannot go in these. He said to Saul, because I'm not used to them. 
I'm used to God and me going out and taking care of business. I'm not used to what you all have as a trappings for what's going to defeat this enemy that's coming against me. So David did what we need to do in the fight when things are not what they should be. So he took them off. Then he took his staff in his hand and chose five smooth stones. Now you can get this right here. David did not come with five stones from his daddy's house as he came to give the food to delivery to his brothers and to the men in the front line. He got those stones from the stream that was right there. Immediately once he made that decision to say, I'm not wearing that armor, I'm, that's not proven, I'm going with what I have in my hand, what I have in my heart, where I'm trusting, and I'm grabbing five smooth stones from the stream. He put them in the pouch of his shepherd's bag. Again, his shepherd's bag, his rod, the stones from the stream. And with his sling in his hand, approached the Philistine. Even the approach didn't make sense. He wasn't trying to sneak around. He wasn't trying to do no fancy dancing. It says, meanwhile, the Philistine with his shield bearer in front of him kept coming closer to David. He's coming closer to the battle line that he didn't even think was necessary because he just figures he's going to destroy y'all, whatever y'all choose to do. I don't care where you are on that hill, whatever's between us, I'm going to destroy you. He looked at David, he looked David over and saw that he was a little more than a boy. There are people looking at you. That's even yourself looking in the mirror. You're saying, I cannot win against the fight and the battle coming against me. You are seeing the fight as a giant and God as little. And this giant looked at David and says, you're nothing more than a, a mere little boy. Who are you? What are you? Am I a dog? He is so offended that the nation hasn't given him an equal champion to fight, at least a man, they've got a little mere boy. This is an insult. Who is this guy? Oh, we knew you all were punks, but now really? He looked David over and saw that he was a little more than a boy, glowing with health and handsome, and he despised him. He said to David, am I a dog that you come at me with sticks? He thought he knew his enemy, David. He thought he knew all of what David's makeup was. He didn't know that David had the spirit of the Lord upon him. He saw the slingshot as sticks. He did not understand the weaponry that David brought with him, which was God. Now, I want y'all to look at this because, and the Philistine cursed David by his gods. So, God is a jealous God, first of all. Y'all know that from Exodus 20. There's no little God that the Philistine could ever have that ever going to go against our almighty God. So he cursed David, who is God. You've heard many people in the Old Testament say, touch not the anointed one, you know, touch not God's anointed. Well, David is anointed at this point. They may not know it. This Philistine doesn't know it, but he's just cursed the future king. He's just cursed the man that God has anointed with the spirit of God on him. And he has the insult to injury to say that by his gods, his gods, but he doesn't know he's dealing with the big G, the God, the only begotten son of God, almighty God, all of them, father, son, and Holy Spirit. It says, come here, he said, and I'll give your flesh to the birds and the wild animals. We know that God made all the birds and the animals and the creations of this entire world. So you're going to do what? You, you're cursing David by his gods. And it, it's just an insult, insult, insult. But listen to what David says. Here's where I want you to see the supernatural knowledge of God. Because that listing of what weapon tree that Goliath had never mentioned a sword. But David knew that there was a sword that that Goliath had. And he was prepared for it and he plans to use it. Now look what it says in verse 45. David said to the Philistine, you come against me with sword. He starts out the list with sword and spear and javelin. The javelin is on Goliath's back. 
He's got the spear that you see. He's got the armor. He's got the greaves. He's got the helmet. But that sword was not a visible thing that was listed in that listing. But he knows everything that he got is weaponry. Where Goliath was so smart, he called his stuff sticks. David says, I know all that you got going on there. And I've already assessed it. And I already know where your weak spot is. You're arrogant. You underestimate God. Because this this what I'm going to tell you that you don't understand. You're not fighting against a little boy. You're fighting against God. Because this battle is not about me. This battle is about him. You have done something against the almighty God. And David's going to make it clear. Listen to what he says. You come against me with sword and spear and javelin, but I come against you in the name, in the name of the Lord Almighty. In the name. Do you get that? I don't need to bring a spear or a sword or a javelin. I'm just coming in the name of the Almighty God because you think you're a giant, but he's all powerful. You're the puny one, champion or hero or not. You're the small one because the great God of Israel I'm just going to say I'm coming in his name. The God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. That insult wasn't just to the armies. It was a defiance to God because they knew by the time you get to 1 Samuel 17, we'd already gone through Exodus. They already knew what happened to Pharaoh's army. The Philistines are not dumb. They're not hitting on a rock under gas. They knew the almighty God, but they were willing to say, we don't care. We're going to talk trash about the armies of Israel, because we are giants. We got it going on. We know we can take you down. So this defiance is not just about the armies of Israel. This is about the God of Israel. And that's why David is making it clear that I'm coming to you in the name of the Lord Almighty, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. This day, the Lord will deliver you into my hands. But I want you to see the prophecy of the Holy Spirit that's telling David, Everything that is about to unfold before it happens. The spirit of the living God of the Lord is on this anointed man. That's why it said he's the chosen one. It says this day the Lord will deliver you into my hands and I'll strike you down. Get this list out, guys. I'm going to strike you down and cut off your head. I'm not just going to kill you. I'm going to cut off your head. I'm going to take this thing down because you have the audacity to curse me and to defy the almighty God, the God of the armies of Israel. And we're going to cut off your head. We're going to set a standard to let you know that will not be tolerated. God don't play with his enemies. He destroys them. He says, strike you down, cut off your head this very day. He's not saying it's going to be in a few months. This very day. I will give the carcasses of the Philistine army. I'm not just going to take care of you and cut your head off. I'm going to tell you there's going to be so much slaughter of the other giants that are in the camp because they sent you out thinking that one could do it all. But I'm going to tell you that we are going to defy and kill all of you. And that the animals that you just talk trash about that you feed my flesh to, those animals are going to be feeding the, from the flesh of the Philistines that we are going to kill in the name of the almighty God, in the power of God. You get ready to see something and you can keep thinking that trash talk is going to work for you. But today, this day, look what the man, look what the man of God says. This very day, I will give the carcasses of the Philistine army to the birds and the wild animals. And the whole world will know that there is a God in Israel. All those gathered here will know that it is not by, he got it right. This victory is going to be from the Lord because this battle, this fight is not about David. This fight is about God. And he's going to say openly, all those gathered here will know that it is not by my, by, by sword or by spear that the Lord saves. And some of you are looking for the bank to save you. are looking for the relative to save you. Looking for the rich person to save you, looking for the job to save you, looking for the government to save you. You need to be trusting in God to save you and to fight the battle in the supernatural where you got your eyes on the natural and you have the fear instead of faith. Now it says here, not by sword or spear that the Lord saves for the battle is the Lord's and he will give 
all of you into our hands. Not just you, Goliath, but all of you. As the Philistine moved closer to attack. Now here's God. Some of us wait. Now you got to wait on the Lord. But some of us, when God says go, move. Trust me and go. Take the leap of faith and let's do this. Let God say, God's going to say, I'm going to take care of this. It says, as the Philistine moved closer to attack him, David ran quickly toward the battle line to meet him. He ran. He didn't slow walk. Maybe God's going to do it. Maybe I need a little help. No, he ran because God knew that he picked the right one. He's the one. This little boy that you all call him Ruddy, he's going to trust God. He's going to trust God for more than the bear and the lion. He's going to trust God for Goliath. The giant fight, he's going because he knows his God is almighty. He may be a giant, but God is almighty. And it says he ran quickly toward the battle line to meet him, reaching into his bag and taking out a stone. He slung it and struck the Philistine. Now look what the words here in the NIV say. He struck the Philistine on the forehead. Now on the forehead is not in it yet, but it's on the forehead. And look what happens. Look at these words. The word of the Holy Spirit says the stone sank into his forehead that it went on it, but then it sank in to his forehead that it actually penetrated. It sank into his forehead. That boy, now, if you know anything about our noggins, we have very hard craniums from the time of birth. And this is a giant. He's pretty big if he's got the kind of measurements of his armor and all this stuff. So imagine this stone that he just pulled out of the stream only a few moments ago that the power of God let it hit the very cranium that God, creation, he knows where the cranium is. It went and sank inside of his forehead. And it says here, and he fell face down on the ground. One blow. And some people have said that that was equivalent to somebody having a, a gun and shooting directly into his scalp, into his brain. It says, verse 50, so David triumphed over the Philistine with a sling and a stone without a sword in his hand. He struck down the Philistine and killed him. But that's not all that happened. David had already prophesied, I'm not only going to strike you down, I'm going to cut off your head. And what does he use to cut off his head? The sword that David knew he had. It says, so David triumphed over the Philistine with a sling and a stone without a sword in his hand and struck down the Philistines and killed him. And David ran and stood over him. He took hold of the Philistine's sword, had to be pretty heavy, and drew it from the sheath, the sheath that was in the javelin the back of the eve. After he killed him, he cut off his head with the sword. Now, when the Philistines saw that their hero was dead, they turned and ran. They got out of Dodge, guys. They saw, I don't know what just happened, but Goliath is down dead. And the boy that they were laughing at, saying this boy is going to be killed in an instant probably, he's got Goliath's head in his hands. And they hightailed and ran. They turned and ran. Then the men of Israel who were just in fear, now all of a sudden because they see the manifestation of God's almighty power, now they have the faith, the real F they should have had all along. They have faith. And it says, then the men of Israel and Judah, it says they surged forward with a shout and over and pursued the Philistines to the entrance of Gath and the gates of Ekron. Their dead were shrewn along the Sharon road to Gath and Ek Ekron. Remember what David had just prophesied? He just told him what was going to happen. When the Israelites returned from chasing the Philistines, they plundered their camp. David took the Philistine's head and brought it into Jerusalem. He put the Philistine's weapons in his own tent. These heavy duty weapons, he put them in his tent. It says, as Saul watched David, Going out to meet the Philistines, the king didn't go. 
the king stayed back and asked the question, who's, who's, whose father is this kid? Who's, who's this kid belong to? He just defeated Goliath. He just gave us the victory. It wasn't him. It was the Lord. And it says, as Saul watched David going out to meet the Philistines in verse 50 uh, and 55, he said to Abner, commander of the army, the, co the commander of the army that was just afraid and terrified, dismayed and terrified, but just went after the Philistines running and did all kinds of torture and killing. He said, who's Abner? Whose son is that young man? Abner replied, as surely as you live, your majesty, I don't know. He was an unknown. He, nobody knew him except for his family folk on the line. They didn't know him because God can use the unknown. God can use the people that you say don't have a title. God can use whoever he sees fit as the chosen one to do his work. He needs a believing person that has faith and trust in him. It says here, the king said, find out whose son this young man is. As soon as David returned from killing the Philistine, Abner took him and brought him before Saul, with David still holding the Philistine's head. Now, I'm going to stop there and go to the end for a couple of things I want to share with you. With God, it is never a fair fight. Our enemies think that they are the victor before they, they see us coming because they say, oh, I'm, I'm the big bank. I can take whatever you got. Oh, I'm this. I'm powerful. I got all this money and prestige. I can do whatever I want to you. No, our God is almighty. Anything that they come against us, they got to come through God. It's only what God allows. And even if something happens to you, you got to understand God will work it out for your good. You just have to trust God. Trust him. I've lived through this too many times. Now go to Ephesians 6 verses 10 through 20. I just want you to see about us understanding that if we are losing fights, it's not because of God. It could be that you are not having the faith in God and his word. You are not wearing the full armor of God. You're trying to do it in your own strength and you cannot win against Satan and his demonic forces in your own strength. That's why God says in verse 10 of Ephesians 6, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood. That's what we got to remember. Our pastor just taught that. Our flesh and blood is not fighting against flesh and blood. We are seeing people in the natural, but there's supernatural warfare going on. And it says, for our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world and against the spiritual forces of the evil in the heavenly realms. The things that we're seeing, even in the politics, that even people that say they know God and love God, they would rather see somebody that does not have any love for God. You all, nobody is a savior but Jesus Christ. Nobody knows you but Jesus Christ. If people don't have, if you haven't heard the person say, I love Jesus, how many times have you heard some of these people say, I love the Lord. Thank you, God. Praise God. That's not even in some of these people's constitution because they don't know God. Satan ain't going to let people in, with demons all around them speak about God. And it says here, therefore, put on the full armor of God so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground. And after you have done everything to stand, stand firm then with the belt of truth. How are you, how are people that say they love God supporting people that don't speak the truth? Stand firm then with the belt of truth buckled around your waist with the breastplate of righteousness in place and with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to all of this, in addition to all of this, take up the shield of faith. You cannot have fear in your fight. You need faith. Take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. And pray. And pray in the spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. I heard somebody say the only thing that we can do is pray. That's the best thing we can do. That's not a, a leftover half thought. 
Praying is powerful. Praying is needed. Praying is the, the access to God, asking for the petitions in the will of God and letting the Lord in the supernatural realm work. Anyway, with this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for all the Lord's people. Pray also for me, this is Paul, that whenever I speak words may be given me so that I will fearlessly make known the mystery of the gospel for which I'm an ambassador in chains. Pray that I may declare it fearlessly as I should. Now, now we're going to the last final round, right? Ah, the last final round. The last final round, here's the six things to take away in this final round. God's victory round, where you're going to have your hands lifted up. Any fight with God on your side is an unfair fight because Isaiah 54, 17 says, no weapon that is fashioned against you shall prosper. No weapon that is fashioned against you shall prosper and you shall confute every tongue that rises against you in judgment. This is the heritage of the servants of the Lord and their vindications from me, says the Lord. No weapon formed against us. It is an unfair fight, but it's against the evil one. It's not us. So remember that as takeaway number one. When it comes to fear, God says, in the word of God, Psalm 23, 4, that we always say in at funerals, fear not for I'm with you. But look what it says. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. They were in warfare. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. You don't have to be fearful. Have faith. Number three, the fight we have in the natural requires supernatural trust. That's why it says for our struggle in, in Ephesians 6, 12, we just read it. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. The fight is a spiritual battle. It is not a natural realm battle. Yes, you may be taking on some fiery darts of the attack, and people saying stuff and, and things going on. But you have to trust. Keep praying. Keep trusting God. Because there's a supernatural battle in the heavenly realm. And that's why God is there. That Jesus is there making petitions and praying with groans that only he can. But you have to pray. That's what he says. Before, you ask nothing in my name. But now ask the Father in his name for everything. It's not, he didn't say Mary's name. He didn't say the Pope's name. He didn't say the bishop's name. He didn't say this elder's name. He didn't say all these names that we put out there. He said, in the name of Jesus, we go to the Father and we pray in accordance to his will. Now, this fourth one, our fights require unconventional decisions and understanding. The armor of God is not what anybody would think is something that we should go into these fights with, but that's exactly what God says in Ephesians 6. We need the armor. Just as David said that what Saul was trying to put on him was unproven, was unfamiliar, was untested, some of you are trying to use armor that is anything other than what God says. Unconventional that it may be, God says, put on his armor. Maybe it's not seen in the natural, and maybe when you go through some things, people are going to say, why are you so calm? You say, I'm trusting in God's armor. I'm trusting in the helmet. I'm trusting in the breastplate. I'm trusting in the belt. I'm trusting in the almighty God and I'm praying. They don't have to understand it because this is an unconventional warfare that's in the heavenly realm. And we have weapons are mighty through God. So we have to understand that the weapons of the five smooth stones, it doesn't make sense. How does he get one out of a stream and able to take down a giant, a champion for the Philistines? It's about the Lord. It's the supernatural power of God's weaponry that he gives us. The sword of the spirit. It's the weaponry of God. Now think about the approach. Most of us would have said the approach that David says was crazy. He's young. He's running toward the guy. He should be doing something else. He should. But the approach that God gives us is not going to make sense. But when he gives us that approach, we're to run quickly. We are to go forward quickly with God. If God tells you to go, go. Don't stutter. Don't study. Don't, don't, don't. I think about it. I need to pray about it. If God says go, go. Trust God. 
Here's another thing. The follow-up. He could have just said, I'm going to kill you and that'd be done. But he'd already had supernatural wisdom and prophecy to say, you're not just going to kill him, you'll cut his head off. And then you're going to go get the rest of them. So God had supernaturally told him, you're going to kill him, you're going to cut his head off, and you're going to kill all these other, other, other Philistines. God doesn't leave enemies standing like we do. He praised God. He gave God from the beginning. He says, this is going to be done in the name of the Lord because the God of the nation of the armies of Israel, you've tried to defy. He put it out there to say that so he would know and we would all know. Like he said, everybody gather around that God didn't do this with a sword or spear. He did it because his name. He did it because of his reputation. He did it because of his power. And David made sure everybody knew going in. Before one, one thing was done, he said this in advance. Now, I want you to understand that because God is always protective of his word, he's protected of his promises because God can't lie. The last of the takeaways is that the Philistines had to understand, just like we saw Pharaoh drowned in the Red Sea, that God, when he defeats his enemies, he doesn't defeat his enemies like we do. He defeated all of those Philistines that came. The armies of the Philistines came and camped. They were dead, 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 because God destroys his enemies. Pharaoh and all of his armies were drowned in the Red Sea. Goliath and the rest of his camp were killed. God does not play with his enemies. We do. And he wants us to stop playing and pick up the armor of God and put it on. Don't talk about it in church and then have it fall off by the time you get to the car with seatbelt on. He wants us to remember that in the fights that we're going through, he is almighty. Whatever we got is giant other than him is a mistake. He, the almighty God, it's unfair fight against our enemies, not against us. So I hope that this has been encouraging. This is for somebody. It's for somebody. I just want y'all to remember that the harvest is ripe but the labors are few. I pray that all of us pray to the Lord of the harvest that we'd have more people to come and to learn of God. As of the 7th of August, 2023, we will be broadcasting our live stream on the YouTube channel at Bordeaux Productions at 9 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. I love you and Lord willing, I will see you next week. God bless you.